My name is Philip, and it's a genuine pleasure to present you with this complete 133 video book. Did I just say 133? That's just the catalog number they gave it when they found it in the Tower of London. Maybe we should call it the Tower Manuscript. I hear they did that for a while. Or, better yet, we could dig up the current catalog number from the Royal Armories in Leeds. Oh, why bother? The real in the know scholars call it the Valpurgis Fechtbuch anyway. It has something to do with a saint in the last folio. Ah, but that's not the final word on the subject. Some call it Liber de Arta Dimicatoria, which simply means the art of fencing. But, oh, to hell with it. Whatever you want to call it, I'm just going to use 133 like the bumbling American I am. This enigmatic sword and buckler fencing manual dates to about 1310 AD, which renders it the earliest extant treatise of its kind. The only surviving copy of 133 was penned by at least three different scribes, and the style itself is vaguely attributed to a Franconian monk simply known as Lutger, the cleric, or Clarus Lutigeris. The language of the text is a medieval Latin shorthand whose full meaning was indecipherable when scholars attempted to study it in the 1600s. Fortunately, consistent German fencing terminology and a lot of additional resources have yielded better results in recent years. Or at least we like to think they have. 133 is fully illustrated and mostly intact, save for a handful of missing pages which I've noted. The text consists of mnemonic verses and longer descriptions of the actions depicted in an arrangement of folios. Each folio bears four scenes, most often represented by separate but related plays. I've combined the front and the back of each folio into single images in the hope that this may provide added context where plays relate to one another across pages. Each page is announced by folio number and recto for the front and verso for the back. I've also announced each passage in case you want to follow along with the version posted on Wichtenauer. My only ad-libs are the addition of the word verse, where a repeated passage appears but wasn't originally noted. If you're unfamiliar with 133, then it may help to know that the figures depicted are that of a pupil and a priest, and the end goal of many sequences of plays is for the pupil to best the priest. The priest often assumes a guarded attitude at the outset called an obsessio, and the word obsessio is referred to as displacement in this translation. To confuse the matter a bit more, the seven custodia are called wards in the translation, but they're also referred to as displacements when they serve the function of an obsessio. Suffice it to say that there are many less than straightforward things about this text, and any practitioner of 133 consigns him or herself to a lifetime of educated speculation. Speaking of speculations, there are many fun theories about this work, not the least of which concern the figure of St. Valperga in the final folio. Some scholars, in fact, believe her presence suggests that 133 was a fencing manual intended for the middle class or priests rather than the knightly class. Before we jump into Folio 1, I'd like to take a moment to thank a gentleman by the name of Dieter Bachmann, whose full translation of 133 I've used for this video book. I'd also like to thank the Board of Trustees of the Armories, who supplied the images. It is my sincere hope that this video book in no way infringes on any copyrighted material. It is the purpose of this video book to provide those who find reading period manuals inaccessibly cumbersome with the means to experience this fantastic piece of history. This video is intended for personal educational use only. Any commercial use of this video is strictly prohibited. And now, without further ado, I present you 133. Folio 1, Recto. Passage 1. Stygian Pluto dares not attempt what dare the mindless monk and the deceitful old woman. Passage 2. It is to be noted how in general all fencers, or all men holding a sword in hand, even if ignorant in the art of fencing, use these seven wards, of which we have seven verses. Passage 3. Seven wards there are, under the arm the foremost, 
to the right shoulder is given the second, to the left the third, to the head give the fourth, give the right side the fifth, to the breast give the sixth, and finally you have the lung ort. Passage 4 It is to be noted that the art of fencing is so described. Fencing is the ordering of diverse strikes and is divided in seven parts as here. Folio 1 Verso, Passage 5 Note that the nucleus of all the art of fencing consists in this latter ward which is called lung ort. Also, all actions of the wards or of the sword are determined by it, i.e., they end in it and not in others. Therefore, do first consider well this above-mentioned ward. Passage 6 It is three parts that proceed, the remaining do follow. These seven parts are also executed by the common, but Brother Lütger has the defense and the means. Folio 2 Recto, Passage 7 It is to be seen that here is the first ward contained, i.e., the one under the arm, and the displacer is in Halpschild. I give the good counsel that the one assuming the ward under the arm do not execute a strike, which is commendable from the Albersleiben, for the reason that he could not reach the upper part, and, reaching anywhere lower, would be pernicious to the head. But the displacer entering to attack may reach him at any time if he fails to observe what is written below. Passage 8. Verse the first ward has two counters, the first counter being Halpschild, the second Lungort. If Halpschild is adopted, fall below both sword and shield. If he is a common fencer, he will strike to the head. Then you should apply Stichschlag. If he binds and enters, then you should counter with Schildschlag. Passage 9 It is to be seen that the one who is higher in directing the strike to the head without Schildschlag if he is a common fencer. But if you would be instructed by the priest's counsel, do bind and enter. Passage 10 Note that the first ward, i.e. the one under the arm, may be displaced by itself. Namely, the displacer may displace the one assuming the first ward with that selfsame ward. Nevertheless, the one assuming the ward can displace the displacer with a displacement that in a way corresponds to the displacement called Halpschild, but differs from it in this, that the sword below the arm is extended above the shield, so that the hand holding the shield is enclosed by the hand holding the sword. Folio 2 Verso, Passage 11 It is to be seen that the pupil is here binding and entering, so that he may place a Schildschlag as below. But he should take heed of what is done by the priest, as after the bind the priest will be the first to act. Passage 11 It is to be seen that the pupil has no option but to do a Schildschlag or to grip the arms of the priest with his left hand, namely sword and shield. Passage 13, verse Here the pupil binds and enters, for him is a Schildschlag, or, with the left hand, he grip the arms of the priest. Passage 14. The priest, on the other hand, has three options, namely, mutation of the sword so that it be higher, or durchtreten, or, with the left hand, grasp the pupil's arms, i.e., sword and shield. Passage 15. These three are for the priest. Durchtreten, mutation of the sword, or with the right hand he may grasp sword and shield. Passage 16. Note that you find here what was said above, executed in the example. Folio 3 Recto, Passage 17. It is to be seen how the first ward is again assumed because of certain actions of this first section, i.e., because of the first ward that was treated first. But all things that belong here you will find on the first page, up to the mutation of the sword. Passage 18, verse. If Halpschild is assumed, fall below both sword and shield. Folio 3, verso, passage 19. 
Here is a binding of the pupils and all other things of which was talked above until the mutation of the sword. Passage 20 Here the pupil is wanting good counsel how he could withstand this, and you must know that if the game stands as here, then a shtich must be executed as commonly contained in the book, even if here is no image. Passage 21 It is to be seen that the priest is here mutating the sword because he was below earlier and now he will be above. Then he moves to free the sword upwards, which is called nuken, whence follows a separation of sword and shield of the pupils. Passage 22 Thence the verse, Such is the monk's nuken, where most of the common will schutzen. Folio 4 Recto, Passage 23 Here the priest should pay attention that he tarry not one instant with the sword, lest from that instant arise an act which is called grappling, but he must immediately re-establish the binding out of caution. Passage 24 here the first ward is reassumed, to which ward the displacement will be very rare, because none uses to apply it save the priest or his clients, i.e. his students, and this displacement is called kukka, and I counsel in good faith that the one executing the ward should bind immediately after the displacement, because it is not good to tarry, or that he should do aught by which he may be saved, or that he should immediately do that which his displacer does. Passage 25. You must know that the displacer must not hesitate, but he should execute immediately a shtich towards the displacer, so that his adversary cannot deliberate what he intend, and that should be diligently comprehended. Folio 4 Verso. Passage 26. Here the priest binds above the pupil's displacement and immediately all the preceding things which you have had above. Granted, you did not have the other two images which follow, where he grasps sword and shield. Passage 27. Note that whenever binder and bound are competing as here, then the bounder may flee whither he chooses if he likes, and this is required in all bindings. But of this you must be admonished, that wherever the bound flees to, you should follow him. Passage 28. Verse. Binder and bound are adverse and irate. The bound flees to the side. I try to follow. Passage 29. Here the priest teaches his pupil how to use these above things that he may grasp sword and shield. As you must know that the priest cannot free himself from such a grip without the loss of sword and shield. Folio 5 Recto. Passage 30. Here the priest defends against what the pupil did above. Passage 31. Here the first ward is reassumed, but all that is necessary you have here in it, except only the omission of the binding, which the pupil omits. Folio 5, Verso, Passage 32. Here the pupil has neglected to bind, and the priest has promptly entered, and not undeservedly, as whenever one assuming the ward omits something he should do, the displacer must immediately enter as here. Passage 33. Displacement as before, but the game is varied. Folio 6 Recto. Passage 34. Above, the priest displaced the pupil. Here now the pupil is executing the same action as the priest before, but the displacer should enter first, if the pupil omits it, as below. Also he should take care that the other reach not his head, which he may. Passage 35 And from the above actions the priest enters. I have said, he should therefore mind his head. Folio 6 Verso, Passage 36 here the first ward is reassumed, namely the one under the arm which is displaced with a certain counter that is called longort, and is a common displacement, and the counters to this displacement are, for the one, assuming the ward, bindings above and below. Passage 37, whence the verse, When longort is executed, do bind immediately above or else below, but the higher binding is always the more useful than the lower one. Folio 7 Recto, Passage 38. 
Here the game of the former ward will take place, namely of binder and bound. Passage 39, whence the verse, binder and bound, are adverse and irate, the bound flees to the side, I try to follow. Passage 40, the name Johannes Herwart of Würzburg appears here. He was the person who looted this copy of 133 in the 1550s during the Franconian campaigns of Albert Archibald, Duke of brandenburg kulmbach Folio 7 Verso, Passage 41. First ward and common displacement as above, but the game varies at the end of the passage. Passage 42. Above, below, but the priest has bound in spite of being below. Folio 8 Recto, Passage 43. Here a mutation of the sword below is taking place. Folio 8 Verso, Passage 44. The first ward is reassumed and displaced by the first displacement, namely Halpschild, and you will have all of the above. Passage 45, verse, when Halpschild is assumed, fall below both sword and shield. One folio is missing between folios 8 and 9. Folio 9, recto, passage 46. It can be seen how here is taught in which way the second ward may be displaced. And I say the second ward because the third ward, which is given to the left shoulder, does not differ much from the second. But here we speak of the second ward, which is given to the right shoulder. And from the same ward, the displacer executes the displacement called Schutzen, because every ward has its protection, which is the meaning of Schutzen. Passage 47. Here the priest places himself in a similar way to the pupil and teaches what will follow from these things. And you must know that, according to the true teaching of the priest, he who was the first to displace can do three things. Firstly, he can push the sword downwards and then durchtreten. Secondly, he can execute a blow from the right side. Thirdly, he can execute a blow from the left side. Note that the opponent can do the same, even though the displacer is the first to be ready. Folio 9 Verso, Passage 48 Here the pupil, instructed by the priest, executes an action that is called Durchtritt. He might get an opportunity for a strike to the left as is done by general fencers, or to the right as is done by the priest and his youths. To counter these two possibilities, the priest may, with the sword under the arm, reach the bare hands of him who executes the above-mentioned strikes, although this counter is not depicted in the example image. Passage 49. Note that the priest deflects the action mentioned above while the pupil is still under way. The priest demonstrates this depressing the pupil's bound sword as shown here in the image. Later you may learn what the priest will make of this if you pay careful attention, etc. Folio 10 Recto, Passage 50 Here, as the priest is in the act of binding from above, he teaches the pupil what may be done against this, namely, Stichlock, which he generally recommends as shown here in the example. Passage 51 the second to the right shoulder, i.e. the second ward. And note that both the one assuming the ward and the one displacing it are in the same position as in the previous example. Folio 10 Verso, Passage 52 Here the priest omits to bind or being bound, and this is an example for his students, so that these may learn what is to be done, the pupil attacks and executes an action put here in the example. Passage 53. Same ward but with a different displacement and it is the one called Halpschild first treated displacing the first ward, i.e. the one under the arm. Folio 11 Recto. Passage 54. Note how many ordinary fencers will be seduced by this displacement shown here. They think they can achieve a separation of sword and shield by means of the strike executed here. This is, however, not the case because the displacer tarries, which could endanger him, but this separation executed is depicted here for all that wish to make use of the counsel of the priest. Passage 55 
Here the priest is about to execute the above strike. He teaches the pupil to turn sword and shield and to attack with the sword as here, so that the opponent may not effectively execute the strike. Folio 11, Verso, Passage 56 Here the priest readopts the first ward, i.e. the one under the arm. Some things were omitted which you had not put before, as shown in the example below. Passage 57 you might ask how the pupil should attack the priest, and it should be known that the priest, by tarrying, omits all defense. In order to teach the pupil, who, as he stands without moving sword or shield, approaches, i.e., as soon as he has the opportunity to strike, as shown in these images. Folio 12 Recto, Passage 58 here the priest adopts third ward, which is displaced by the student as shown. The counter to this displacement will be a bind, and I say bind, but only above and no other as in the example below. Passage 59. Here the priest binds, which is better and more profitable, because if he did aught else less occupying the adversary's sword, it would be to his loss. Folio 12 Verso, Passage 60. From the above bind, the priest teaches his little client to get sword and shield by embracing the arms of his opponent, as shown here. Passage 61. Here the third ward is adopted as before, and the same displacement, but the game is varied. Folio 13 Recto. Passage 62. Here the priest teaches his little client who executes a displacement and teaches him to enter if a bind is omitted. Passage 63, the same third ward, viz. on the left shoulder, and the same displacement called Halpschild as above. Folio 13 Verso, Passage 64, note that all actions of the first ward, viz. under the arm, are here up to the next sign of the cross. Folio 14 Recto, Passage 65, here the third ward is readopted, which will be displaced by Lungord, which all common fencers execute, and the counter to this displacement are two binds, one on the right above the sword, the other on the left. Folio 14 Verso, Passage 66, Verse, Binder and bound are adverse and irate, the bound flees to the side, I try to follow. Passage 67, Now that the third ward has been treated, here the fourth is treated, which will have Halpschild as its displacement, and all that you had before you will find here up to the next sign of the cross. One folio is missing between folios 14 and 15. Folio 15, Recto, Passage 68. Here the priest readopts the fourth ward. The displacement of this fourth ward will be the first ward, and this is an example to his pupils, as here shown in the example. Passage 69. After above the pupil has displaced the priest, here he again displaces him, and that below the arm, and note how all this has been treated with the first ward, i.e. the one under the arm, up to the next sign of the cross. Folio 15 Verso. There is no text for this page. Folio 16 Recto. Passage 70. Here the first ward is readopted, viz. under the arm, and its displacement will be Lungort and is common and of limited value. And note that he who adopts the ward has three possibilities. Firstly, he may bind right above the sword. Secondly, he may left below the sword. Thirdly, he may grip the sword with his hand as shown below in the next example. Folio 16 Verso, Passage 71 Here the priest grips, i.e., he teaches to grip, the displacer's sword, and note that the sword of said displacer may not be freed except by means of a schildschlock, where the priest's hand is struck with the shield, as below in the next example. Passage 72. Here the pupil's sword is freed by means of the schildschlock, and the priest should take care that the pupil does not execute a strike to his head, or a general stab, which the priest is wont to teach his students. 
Also, you should know that if the pupils strike to the head, execute a protection with the sword together with the shield in the left hand, and so you will strike the shield from the hands of your adversary, as shown below in the next example. Four folios are missing between folios 16 and 17. Folio 17, Recto, Passage 73. Here the priest adopts the sixth ward, which is given to the breast, and note it is solely this stab that must be executed, which is executed from the fifth ward up to the sign of the cross. Passage 74. Here the priest from the said sixth ward executes a stab, and a stab is also executed from the fifth ward. Folio 17 verso, passage 75. Here the pupil by binding resists and deflects this stab of the priests in the next above in the next example thus. Passage 76. After all the wards above have been treated, here the seventh ward is treated, which is called Lungort, and note that there are four binds, that to answer this ward, namely two from the right, and the other two from the left. But here we speak only of the first bind, above the sword, which you have all in the first ward up to the fourth example where the sword and shield are taken. Folio 18 Recto, Passage 77 it is now to be seen how the pupil was the first to bind above the priest's sword in the preceding example. Here the priest approaches and erects his sword and shield for the protection of his head. Passage 78. Here the pupil can perform Schildschlag, and from the counter he can inflict a blow to the priest. Folio 18 Verso. Passage 79. Here the bound, i.e. the one below, grips the sword and shield of the one above. Passage 80. Here the pupil voluntarily drops sword and shield, intending to grapple with the priest as below. Folio 19 Recto. Passage 81. Above the priest was grabbed by the pupil and forced to grapple, which the priest may prevent as shown in the example. Passage 81. Here the same final ward is adopted by the pupil. The priest counters, and it is one of the four binds, namely the one below and left, as shown in the images. Folio 19 Verso, Passage 83 After the example above, in the following the priest is bound from below, but the pupil may reach the priest's head, because his sword was higher. And note, in all binds from below, one should guard the head, lest it be hit as here. Passage 84, whence the verse, when binding from below, take care that you are not deceived. When you are bound from below, the head of the binder can be reached. Passage 85, above the pupil executes a strike and hits the head of the priest, which the priest prevents here by countering, as shown in the example. Folio 20, Recto, Passage 86. Here the final ward is again adopted, which is called Lungort, and here the priest is adopting it. But the pupil executes one of the four binds, viz. above the sword, as shown here in the example. Passage 87. After above there was a bind above the priest's sword, one may see here how the priest defends himself against this by an action called Stich, as shown here. Folio 20 Verso, Passage 88 Here the final ward is adopted, viz. Longort, by the pupil. Above this ward the priest binds with one of the four binds, viz. above the sword and to the right. And note that whenever there is a bind, the bound may flee from the binder to wherever he likes, to the left or to the right. Thence you may diligently see that if he flees, you will follow him, as in the verse, the bound flees to the side I try to follow. Verse, binder and bound are adverse and irate, the bound flees to the side I try to follow. Passage 89 from this bind treated above, executed by the priest, the pupil flees as said above, and as shown here, because he flees under the arm, the priest immediately follows, cutting his head, like here. 
Folio 21 Recto, Passage 90. Note that this is a different ward, viz. Upper Lung Ort, which is adopted here by the priest as an example to his pupils, and he instructs his pupil to execute this action, viz. to position himself as shown here in the example. Passage 91. Here the priest binds in order to counter the pupil, and it will be one of those four binds, viz. above the sword and to the right, which you had in all other part treated above. Folio 21 Verso, Passage 92 After above the priest had bound, here the pupil wants to hit the priest in another way, and note that as the priest thinks that he could enter a bind, the pupil hits the same priest's arms. Note also that he only hits the arms, but the power of this blow lies in the stab, which may also be executed here. Passage 93. Here the priest notices that his arms are endangered, and he draws himself back, intending to strike, but the pupil follows as here, etc. Folio 22 Recto, Passage 94. Here a common ward is adopted, which is called Fiddlepoga, executed by the priest. The pupil counters it by positioning himself as shown here in the images. Passage 95. Then the pupil placed his sword on the priest's arm, which also counts as a bind as shown above. Here the priest turns the hand holding the shield and grasps the pupil's sword, as in this example. Folio 22 Verso, Passage 96. Here the same ward is readopted vis fiddlepoga, executed by the priest, the pupil acting as above. Passage 97. Here the priest binds as above. Folio 23 Recto. Passage 98. From this bind the priest does a schildschlock as treated often above, from the above mentioned binds. Passage 99. Note that the final ward is readopted vis langort, concerning which it should be noted that a stab is executed, by means of which the one in the ward is stabbed in the belly, i.e., he is penetrated by the sword, and note that of this paragraph not more than these two images are shown, which was the fault of the painter. Folio 23 Verso, Passage 100 here the priest adopts his special ward, vis Langort, which is displaced by the pupil, whose displacement will be Halbschild, as shown here in the example. Passage 101. Here the priest puts himself under the sword of the pupil, as was often treated. Passage 102. Whence the verse, if Halbschild is assumed, fall below both sword and shield. Folio 24. Recto. Passage 103. After the priest above positioned himself to the scholar, the scholar here binds and steps, intending to do which follows, because you had many forms above, it is not necessary to give more examples, therefore the verse, the binder and the bound, etc. Verse. Binder and bound are diverse and irate, the bound flees to the side, I try to follow. Passage 104. Note that from this bind of the part of the pupil, a useful strike is executed, viz. a separation of sword and shield of the priest, and entering, but no more of this is written in this book, as shown here in this example. Folio 24 Verso, Passage 105. Here the special ward of the priests is readopted, which is called Langort, as seen above, and again the pupil displaces it with Halbschild, as above, but other examples follow, as shown below. Passage 106. Here the priest positions him to the pupil, as was seen often before. Folio 25 Recto, Passage 107. It is to be noted that the pupil is here dealing a common strike which all common fencers are wont to deal from the position just treated, namely, when binder and bound are engaged, and the binder who is above goes to the head and omits a schildschlock, from which follows a strike, and the priest enters as here. Passage 108. 
Note that here again the special ward of the priest is assumed that is called Longort, but it is a very strange displacement that is depicted here and very rare, and you must know that this can be reduced to the first ward and to the displacement called Halpschild, etc. Folio 25 Verso Passage 109 Here the priest executes the above-mentioned stab, because the pupil who has displaced in the previous example omits all actions because he has bound, he would have been underbound as in the following example. Passage 110. It is to be noted that from these actions this above-mentioned stab by the priest the pupil will here bind, which is necessary if we want the stab depicted above to be deflected. One folio is missing between folios 25 and 26. Folio 26 recto, passage 111, verse, Binder and bound are adverse and irate, the bound flees to the side, I try to follow. Passage 112, here the third ward is displaced by the special ward of the priests that is called Longort, and I counsel in good faith that he who is performing the third ward should not at all delay his actions, because otherwise the one performing the priest's displacement will enter with a stab, which is a common practice of the priests. Folio 26 Verso, Passage 113 after the priest has been displaced above, the pupil does hear Schutzen while the priest is executing a bind as shown here. Passage 114. Here the fourth ward is assumed again, and it is displaced by the special ward of the priest. It is now up to the priest to displace, and the pupil enters above, and all the actions that you had before will follow. Folio 27 Recto. Passage 115. Here again the fifth ward is assumed, and it is displaced by the special ward of the priest that is called Longort, as shown in the example. Passage 116. Verse. Binder and bound are adverse and irate. The bound flees to the side. I try to follow. Folio 27. Verso. Passage 117. Here the fifth ward is displaced, its displacement being Halpschild. And note that the one executing the ward may do only two things. Firstly, he can execute a stab. Secondly, he can execute a strike to divide shield and sword. Passage 118. Above the pupil was displaced. Here, however, he gets to do a stab as shown in the example. Folio 28, Recto, Passage 119 After the above stab executed by the pupil, here the priest defending does Schutzen and gets the opportunity for a strike which is a general rule in the art of the priest. Passage 120 Here the fifth ward is resumed which will be countered by Hulpschild as shown in the example. Passage 121. Note that whenever Halpschild is assumed against this fifth ward or against the second ward, a strike from the one assuming the ward is always to be expected, which could divide sword and shield. Thence the counsel that whenever you execute this displacement, i.e. Halpschild, you should enter with a stab without mercy. Folio 28 Verso. Passage 122. Here the pupil executes a shtich because the priest omits his defense, as shown here in the example. Passage 123. Here the priest deflects the action executed above as shown here by the priest. Folio 29. Recto. Passage 124. First as above in the third example of the pictures, the same stab is executed by the pupil, and this stab is deflected by the priest by means of a schildschlag, as shown here in the example. Passage 125. 
Here the fifth ward is again resumed, of which much was said above, and it is to be noted that the priest is displacing the pupil with a displacement that is rare and very good, as an example for his students. And you have to know that if the pupil executes a stab, which to execute is usually the use, the priest must also execute a stab against the stab of the pupil, because his will be more effective, entering with the left foot. But if he does not want to enter, he should nevertheless retract his right foot and not omit this stab. But if the pupil displaces against him by means of halpshilt, the priest should fall below sword and shield, and then will follow those things which were seen before. Passage 126, thence the verse, if halpshilt is assumed, fall below both sword and shield. Folio 29 Verso, Passage 127. Here the pupil completes his stab, the priest omitting all actions. Passage 128. Here note that the priest deflects the pupil's stab. Folio 30 Recto, Passage 129. It is to be seen that here the fourth ward is again assumed, and the displacement to this fourth ward is the special longort of the priest. But the displacer should see that the one assuming the ward does not execute a strike as it would be dangerous to tarry, therefore he should execute schutzen and finally not omit a stab. Passage 130 here, on the other hand, the priest is displacing the pupil, which I consider to be better, and what can be learned from anybody, because if he did not, the pupil would enter with a stab which would now be possible for him. And from these actions follows the game of the first ward, that is, of the binder and the bound, which is shown below in the first example. Folio 30, Verso, Passage 131 here will be the bindings that were treated often above, whence the verse, the binder and the bound, are contrary and enraged, etc. Verse, binder and bound are adverse and irate, the bound flees to the side, I try to follow. Passage 132. From these above bindings the pupil executes this strike, lifting his sword to the head by means of a schiltschlock. Folio 31 Recto, Passage 133. It is to be seen that the priest deflects the above strike delivered by the pupil in this way, as the pupil's sword has been below, and as he was about to deliver a strike moving his sword, the priest has the opportunity for a strike before the pupil could put his sword to its use, as shown here in the example. Passage 134. Here the fourth ward is reassumed, whose displacement is the special lung ort of the priest. And it is to be noted that whenever the game is set in this way, I counsel the one assuming the ward, and also the one displacing him, that none should delay in what they have to do, i.e., on one hand the one assuming the ward, a displacement, on the other hand the one displacing, a stab. Folio 31 Verso, Passage 135 Above, both the one assuming the ward and the one displacing it were referred to, and because the pupil, who was the displacer, will be quicker, he executes what he should, namely, first Schutzen, as here, and in the next example below, a stab, because the priest is omitting all actions. Thus, the one entering first will be the first to do damage to his opponent. Passage 136 After the actions of the pupils and the omission of the actions of the priests were discussed above, the priest is here omitting what he should do, and the pupil is completing the obvious attack as shown here. One folio is missing between folios 31 and 32. Folio 32 Recto, Passage 137 It is to be seen that the first ward is reassumed, i.e. the one below the arm, the replacement to which is the special second ward of the priest on the right shoulder, and take note that the one assuming the ward will schutzen without delay, 
Otherwise, his opponent will execute Halpschild, which would be disastrous for the one assuming the ward, and from here will be generated all the things related to the first ward that were treated in the first choir. Passage 138. The priest assuming the ward is here executing Schutzen, which will be for the reason that he was first to be ready, and it is good counsel that the displacer will bind immediately above the sword of the one assuming the ward, which is here omitted, as shown in the example. Folio 32 Verso, Passage 139 Here will be bindings above and below, as they occur often, thence the verse, binder and bound, etc. Verse Binder and bound are adverse and irate, the bound flees to the side. I try to follow. Passage 140. From the above bindings, Valpurgis executes a Schildschlag because she was higher and quicker to be ready. I hope you've enjoyed this rendition of 133 as a video book, brought to you by the Edge of the World Historical Fencing Academy.